Welcome everyone to St. Thomas University and to our 32nd Be God Memorial Lecture in Human Rights. I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional terra unceded territory of the Willistaquaic and Mi'kmaq people. On our campus, we fly the flags of the Willistaquaic and the Mi'kmaq Grand Council to publicly acknowledge that Stu is located on the traditional territory of the Willistaquaic. We look forward to the VGOD lecture every year. Over three decades, we have attracted national and international human rights thinkers and leaders to our campus. St. Thomas offers the only Department of Human Rights in Atlantic Canada, and we approach human rights through the lens of law and activism. This lecture nicely complements the expert teaching that our students receive. Historian Dr. Bernie Vigod was an advocate of human rights and civil liberties. In 1971, he joined the Department of History at the University of New Brunswick, where he taught for 17 years. An outstanding teacher and scholar, Dr. Vigod was also an associate dean of UNB's School of Graduate Studies and Research, as well as a member of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Dr. Vigod served the cause of human rights with distinction as he spoke and published extensively on human rights issues. He also advised public officials on human rights issues and was a leader in many organizations dedicated to promoting human rights. This lecture series is dedicated to his memory and has featured distinguished speakers on human rights issues. As countries have begun to roll back human rights protections, the need to know and understand human rights has never been greater. The topic of this year's lecture speaks to the changes brought by information technology and all it has manifested in data capture and usage. Like tonight's subject, the course is offered by Dr. Sherledge and her colleagues in our Department of Human Rights show how far the discipline has expanded and needed to expand. Our students have courses in charter rights, international human rights, environmental rights, popular culture and human rights, crimes against humanity, and gender identity rights. Dr. Bernie Vigod was an inspiring scholar and teacher, an ardent promoter of human rights, and a tireless worker for justice. Through our teaching of human rights, we try to live up to that ideal. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Dr. Wong, for giving you of your time to speak to us and our students in the wider community. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for being here, particularly those of you who are visiting from out of town, including Dr. Bernie V. God's widow, Zina Zimsis, who's traveled here all the way from Vancouver, and my dad. <laughs> uh, my dad is here from Winnipeg. Um, a warm welcome to, uh, to everyone here. I'm Dr. Christina Shirley, director of the Atlantic Human Rights Center and associate professor in the Human Rights Department. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Wendy H. Wong. Her lecture titled, We, the Data, Claiming Human Rights in the Digital Age, poses the, sorry, um, her lecture will address the challenges digital technology poses to the realization of human rights. Dr. Wong studies global governance. She's particularly attentive to how non-state actors govern at the global and domestic levels. Her areas of interest are emerging technologies, human rights, and humanitarian assistance. Dr. Wong has written two award-winning books, Internal Affairs and The Authority, Trapped, uh, Authority Trap. She's penned dozens of peer-reviewed articles and chapters, and has contributed to several media outlets, including The Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, and The Conversation. She has been awarded grants from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada and the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, among other granting agencies. 
Currently, Dr. Wong is Principal's Research Chair and Professor of Political Science at University of British Columbia. Dr. Wong is a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists. She is on leave from the University of Toronto, where she is Canada Research Chair in Global Governance and Civil Society and Professor in Political Science. Previously, she was a research lead at the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society at the University of Toronto. From 2012 to 2017, she was director of the Trudeau Center for Peace, Conflict, and Justice at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Dr. Wong's PhD is from the University of California, San Diego, and she earned her undergrad at UC Berkeley. Please join me in warmly welcome, welcoming Dr. Wendy Wong. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and welcome to Stu. Um, first of all, I'd love to thank the Vigod family for their support of this event in the memory of Dr. Bernie Vigod. It's such an honor to speak at an event commemorating the life and work of someone who is so committed to human rights. I would also like to thank Zena Simsis for her kind invitation and Dr. Christina Shirley for all the work that has gone into this event and made this all possible. So today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, a book that I will, that's actually coming out next in, in about a year, in 2023, um, and it's gonna be out with MIT Press. So, a little bit about the book, it came to me as a kind of a pandemic project. So right around the time when the pandemic was starting to hit, um, I was locked down like everyone else, working from home, taking care of my young kids with my husband, relying more than ever on apps and the online world that we've all become accustomed to, to do our jobs, and at the time, literally everything else. So it became a great time for reflecting on how pervasive digital technologies have become and how much of our lives have changed because of them, but also because our lives have become data uh, as, a part, as a part of that process. So in the short time we have together today, I'm gonna to be talking about some of the concepts that I introduced in the book and provide a rationale for why we need a human right to data literacy. All right, a little bit of a quiz. What do Amazon.com, basketball legend Shaquille O'Neal and the reality TV show Shark Tank have in common. Does anyone know and care to shout it out? Anyone? No volunteers, okay. Well, they all have in common the Ring Doorbell. The Ring Doorbell is now owned by Amazon um, since 2018. It was initially featured on the show Shark Tank and it really took off after Shaq signed on for a, a multi-commercial deal with the then startup. Now I'm sure many of you today sitting in the audience have encountered the Ring or other video doorbells, so the Google Nest or the Arlo or the Blink, which is also owned by Amazon. You may even own one of these or you may live in a place that uses one of these. After all, our neighbors to the south, about 16% of American households have a video doorbell on their, on their homes. And the sales of these devices actually surged during the pandemic. So here in Canada, we saw sales go up and, and around the world. So the Ring, along with other video doorbells, offer purchasers the, the ability to record and monitor the area around their doors or wherever these doorbells happen to be put up. They can uh, provide audio and visual recordings. They can allow the owners of these doorbells to speak to people who ring them. And you can answer the door when you're not even at home. Right, that's the appeal. On top of that, you can link to a bunch of other Ring products. So Ring offers cameras and lights that you can sort of string together to make your own home security system. So you might be asking, well, what does a smart doorbell like the Ring have anything to do with human rights? Increasingly, everyday objects are raising important questions for the human experience, and therefore, human rights. As our devices become more and more data intensive, and the emerging technologies that we've become accustomed to, such as artificial intelligence, rely on massive pools of data in order to function, more and more of our everyday mundane activities become data. 
In other words, data taken from us, about us, in the most unexpected and often mundane ways have become important. So I'll clarify some of this a little bit later on, but I want to talk a little bit about the ring and how it fits in. So the ring's audio and visual detection and recording abilities change the terms of who can survey. Where we might be accustomed to closed circuit TV monitoring, we might understand in public places and certain privately owned areas why these, this kind of monitoring and surveillance is important. Ring products are placed on homes, typically, facing the street where people walk in public spaces. So this surveillance is being done by homeowners for private purposes en masse. And our images and our voices are being captured on these ring snippets, creating audio and visual data for analysis. Ring has gotten into some controversy for some of its practices as a company. For example, it has agreements with law enforcement agencies to share ring camera data, sometimes without the knowledge or consent of the doorbell's owners. And doorbell owners, through paid subscriptions, can download video and audio captured on their devices. So sometimes this can work in unanticipated ways, this technology. There have been a number of documented cases where, where hackers actually hijacked ring devices uh, using the camera and two-way microphone to stalk children and harass the elderly and other unsuspecting users of the, te the technology. In other words, surveilling those who wanted their surveillance to begin with. And we, as the pedestrians or the drivers, who are probably unaware of these devices as we go about our daily lives in our neighborhoods, we're not consenting to those recordings. Um, we're not consenting to those activities, however mundane or harmless they are, to being captured. And doorbell owners uh, don't always consent to the use of the footage caught on their devices if, uh, if there are uh, official police purposes for, for taking that data. So when we think about consent, practically speaking, it's very hard to consent to all of the activities to which uh, or of which Ring doorbells and other devices are capturing. And Ring is just one of many countless smart devices that record and share data about us with various entities, whether corporate or government, that have an interesting in, interest in collecting data about people. So this raises several questions. First, to what extent are human activities and human existence becoming data? And secondly, and most critically for my work, how are our rights as human beings being tested and perhaps violated in the social context in which data-intensive devices are ubiquitous in our pockets, on our wrists, on our desks, and in our homes? So of course it goes beyond doorbells and ring products. We are surrounded by these so-called smart devices, and these smart devices are smart because they're gathering data about you, and they function based on those data that they gather, and they're everywhere. So the ubiquity of, our the ubiquity of these kinds of devices in our lives are, is simply becoming too pervasive to ignore. So of course, there are obvious ways to which we might contribute to these data, if you think about your social media participation, your texting, your you know, online device, your, your smart devices that you know, record your steps or your heartbeats or whatnot, these are things that are actively collecting data that you might want collected. But there are also non-obvious ways that our devices, of course, are collecting data about us, perhaps that we, we don't think about, or we only thought about when we now have to consent to the cookies on websites, or the way that we behave with our devices when we carry them with us, or how we create data when we transact, whether through credit cards or loyalty programs and other things. So more of, more of our lives have become digital data, that is data that can be stored in computers. And these data are important because they are about or from people. This process has been called datafication in the media and science and technology studies world. And the datafication of our lives is a fundamental shift in the way that human beings have occupied the world in previous eras. Increasingly, there are scarce areas of our lives that are not being recorded, archived, pooled, and sorted into uh, data about us and people like us. So like the doorbell, many of the data that are being generated today are both voluntary and involuntary in nature. 
right? We choose to put our phones with our life's data in them. I do this, right? We have our contacts, we have everyone, all of our appointments are in these phones. They keep lots of important information for us. But you know, these, these phones, these smartwatches, and other devices have all kinds of sensors that also have data about you, you know, in terms of where you are in the world geographically, how quickly you might be walking, how much we're using different apps for what purposes and when, and many other things that we simply aren't thinking about. So data are capturing all of our basic life functions in an approximation not just of our individual lives, but actually as our collective life as a species. So like other researchers who have argued that datafication has changed human life, I argue that data, when taken in their totality, are reflective of who we are as human beings. They aren't something that can or should be abstracted away from the people from which they came, although that is often the case today. By calling data other things, whether we call it exhaust, trails, dust, byproducts, even comparing data to a valuable commodity like oil, what we're doing is drawing attention away from the fact that, these, that we're using our technologies to take data from people. We are the sources of those data, and those data are being collected or extracted by data collectors. There's a popular saying online that kind of goes something like, if you're not the customer, you're the product. It came about as a way to explain how it is we could access so many free apps and programs and not really pay anything monetarily for them, even though these apps and programs clearly cost a lot of money to develop. So the answer was that, of course, that we were paying through data, through data collected from us when we were using these products and these data were being collected, analyzed, and sold for profit. But that's really only putting the economic part of the effect of datafication on the analysis. And so, you know, the shift in human life that has been caused by datafication goes beyond economic relationships. The shifts are about how we relate to one another socially. They are about how power and resources are distributed in society, and therefore these are political questions. And they also talk about how we, um, how we practice what we do in our communities, going at the very heart, again, of how we think about ourselves and how we identify our communities. So at the risk of stating the obvious in our times, I think that if there are humans involved in data, we really should be thinking about data in terms of human rights. So for the moment, um, we haven't adequately drawn on human rights to address the changes in the human experience that datafication has brought about. And this is because we've often elected to focus on one or two rights to a great extent. Um, often you'll hear you know, folks talking about our right to privacy or the freedom from surveillance, when in fact those are just a handful of the rights that have been developed in the grand spectrum of rights possibility as defined in international agreements. I think that the main hang-up at the moment is a lack of stakeholdership. So despite the fact that the great many of us are data sources, we're relatively disempowered compared to data collectors. So in spite of being data subjects, we're not actively data stakeholders in the process. We're not active stakeholders in datafication. Stakeholdership is about knowing how our technologies affect us, both negative and positive consequences alike, what options arise from those consequences, and finding common affinities around which to act collectively. All of this can't happen, as I argue in the book, without data literacy, which I will return to at the end of the talk. And this is, that for those reasons, data literacy ought to be considered a human right. So what we need to, you know, center, um, we need to recenter human beings in our conversations about emerging technologies. We need to be able to identify commonly held values and, and, and think about how these technologies infuse themselves in our lives through those values. We have to remember that we're an important half of datafication as the data sources, but that data collectors have been shaping the trajectory of how these data and how these emerging technologies have developed to date. So human rights can help us recenter our humanity by reminding us that, that, that 
humans and the data being collected are actually tethered. Because human rights give us entitlements. They are firm statements of our interests and the contours of defining what datafication could be. Now, that's just one part of it. I think the other part of the problem today that we see with datafication and human rights is that, that human rights have become a bit stuck because of the nature of data. I call this the nature of data sticky, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in the context of, of datafication. But for now, data are sticky in ways that human beings have yet to encounter. They're a fundamentally different type of, of phenomenon. And because data are about people, and data are used to make all kinds of inferences that affect our analog lives, we really need to acknowledge that the very nature of data, their stickiness, creates a challenge for human rights that we have to confront. At the same time, I think that human rights are exactly the type of framework from which we should, we should, base, uh, we should proceed in the datafied world. So how can human rights help? Now, you know, this audience, I'm sure, is familiar with a lot of the different contours of human rights, and I, I want to draw attention to a, a bit of the historical elements of, of the human rights framework. So as political scientist Jack Donnelly argues, human rights are not about what humans are, but what humans might become. In other words, they're about potential. So many of you in the crowd might be familiar with the story of, of human rights, how they came to fruition after World War II at the international level. Initial efforts culminated with the acceptance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, otherwise known as the UDHR, in 1948. Through years of negotiations, state delegates came up with the 30 articles they saw as key to the establishment of international human rights, which are universal, unconditional, and interdependent. So some examples, freedom of expression, freedom from torture, but also the right to education, the right to choose one's marriage partner, the right to a fair trial. Now, these rights have lots of different rationales and they protect all kinds of different areas of human life. So how they fit together was not immediately obvious. One of the co-authors of the UDHR, the famed French diplomat and lawyer René Cassin, came up with a framework, which he likened to the portico of a Greek temple. As you can see, there are steps leading up to a beautiful entryway where the pillars hold up the roof of human rights, and the rights are organized by an internal logic that go from individual to collective as we move across the pillars from left to right. And undergirding all those pillars and the portico are the foundational values of dignity, liberty, equality, and brotherhood. These are the four values uh, that we need to focus on in order to reorient our approach to datafication using human rights. It's not that the values themselves have changed, but that the way we think about these four values must change and has changed because of the technolo technological affordances that have come about. In other words, what is possible in a human life is different from uh, when the UDHR was, was written. Now, each of these words we might be tempted to try to you know, boil these four very important words into simple definitions. Um, and you know, there are tons of, of uh, books written about all of these ideas. But I think what we need to do is think about, in general, what we mean broadly about these four terms. And I'll, you know, I'll just offer some basic framework for that. So you know, liberty, or, or I think more accurately, autonomy, means acting unencumbered in the world. Right, to make and act on choices freely. That's what we mean by autonomy. Now, brotherhood is a little bit of an outdated word, so in the book I talk about community. I think community captures this idea about sociality and membership in the human community. Dignity is about the worth of a person, both in feeling and in treatment. And finally, equality speaks to a desire to be treated without discrimination and in accordance to a certain baseline. Right? These are the real values that are being translated into human rights. So the importance of dignity and equality, of autonomy and community haven't changed, but data stickiness does change what we might have to be concerned with. Where the framers of the UDHR were worried about physical detention and physical restraints on human beings flourishing, 
We now also have to think about how that flourishing is limited by digitization. We have to recognize what the framers could not, which is that human life is both physical and digital. What I argue in the book is that the stickiness of data changes, in fact hurts, our abilities to exercise autonomy and dignity. How data stick to us is a question not only for equality, but equity of the human condition. And finally, the implications for community to update this term for, as an updated way to think about brotherhood are many, and we don't actually have the answers for dealing, for dealing with how data-intensive technologies impair social coherence. All right, so let me talk a little bit about the stickiness of data. What I mean by stickiness is sticky like the gum on the bottom of your shoe. It's very easy to step on gum, and it's very hard to take it off your shoe. In a similar way, it's very easy to generate data through our activities, but not so easy to get rid of them or even know about their creation for four reasons. <clears throat> now, we know that data are easily copied and transferred for the economists in this room. That's their non-rival and only partially excludable. But it's not just those qualities that make data incredibly useful and problematic. I contend the stickiness is influenced by first the mundaneness of the data being collected. So the great majority of the data from people is actually quite mundane in the sense that they're not remarkable. They're not, in fact, maybe even all that interesting, um, which makes them a little bit more inv invasive in that sense. Right? It's not just about our choices as individuals, what our Amazon cart looks like or how long our jog is, but little things about our devices and our locations and our behavioral quirks or physiological traits like your body temperature or your gait when you're walking. So the mundaneness of the data collected demonstrates not just that data have value when collected across a population, but that we are also increasingly having our very everyday activities recorded for someone to analyze, categorize, and generate predictions from. These activities we might have called in the past private, or not even that, simply boring, right? Things that are unremarkable. Data are also sticky because they're linked. So the data one organization collects about your activities does not just stay within that organization's bounds. The data we generate have both social and economic value, and these data are, are sold and resold to interested parties whether those are companies in pursuit of profit or governments that have an interest in their citizens. Not only that, it has become so cheap to grab data and archive that data that it makes sense to do so for nearly everyone. So linking data, of course, can have very positive benefits. Um, you can, for example, in medical research, analyze large quantities of data to try to find vaccines or cures for, for um, persistent diseases. But there are also negative externalities, negative consequences that have to be weighed against those benefits or those possible benefits. Thinking about data safety. What are the implications of collecting and pooling all kinds of sensitive information about individuals that can then be used to deny them insurance, raise insurance rates, or otherwise discriminate against certain medical conditions? Data are also sticky because they're as good as forever. Once datafied, information about you is really hard to verify its solution for, right? It's also easy to transfer data between users. And because you can never really verify that it's actually gone, it's as good as forever once it's created. Finally, data are sticky because of co-creation. And this is something I'm gonna talk a little bit at length at because this is getting at the idea that even though you are the source of data, you're not actually creating those data. Someone else is, right? The data collector is actually the one taking the data and, and, and gathering the data. So new data are, are created in a sort of collaboration between a source and a collector. And without the source, there's no data. And without the collector, there's no data. So it's a co-created phenomenon. And this characteristic of data poses a practical problem if we want to think about important human rights questions, like whose data are they, right? Is it because it's your, is it because you're the source, so it's your data? Or is it 
the collector's data because they took the time to actually record the behavior. Now beyond the data source and data collector distinction, there's also a need to draw attention to the fact that many of the data uh, that are being collected are often collective in nature. All right? So when we think about this explicitly, say someone posts a photo of you in a group shot on their social media, or how data are sorted, the reality is data are, are taken and then you know, repackaged to create categories of, quote, people like you. So data come from individuals, but are actually used to make new groupings from which to draw inferences and make predictions. We all, therefore, have the possibility of actually affecting someone else's experiences in life without even knowing it or how we did it. So when data are created, they're not created in isolation, and they have both collective and individual implications. So this book is about understanding how data stickiness fundamentally challenge rights that we take for granted. For example, the freedom of expression. But it is mainly about things that are fundamentally human, but not typically discussed or often awkwardly framed in human rights terms because we don't actually have a way to think about how our existing rights exist, uh, sorry, existing rights address new concerns brought about by datafication. Okay, so let's talk through an example together, like facial recognition technology. Privacy is often used to talk about the threats posed by facial recognition technologies. Such technologies translate the features on a human face into a series of measurements, called a face print, and, to comp and they compare one face print to other face prints to make predictions about, um, about people, about the individuals that belong to that face print or vice versa. But what is truly private about a face, which we used to interact with others socially on a routine basis? A face has a lot of social and cultural meaning is attached to it, and it's also one of the most mundane things we have as human beings. Hours after being born, babies gravitate toward human faces, and we know that weeks later they recognize their caregivers' faces as different from other faces. So the face is clearly a central part of who we are and how we fit into society. Now by extension, although we are the rightful owners of our physical faces, who owns this face print made of your face? Facial recognition technologies create conundrums because those technologies rely on co-created data. In that sense, is data from your face yours or the collector's? That facial recognition databases are linked to other data and other databases means that for, the most, for most of us, our facial data are out there in ways we can't even realistically begin to fathom. They are effectively forever. If you use Facebook or any of, it, or any of Meta's products, uh, YouTube, Venmo, or you basically have your face on a generally accessible website, your face is probably in Clearview AI's data set. Since news broke in 2020 of the existence of a small company called Clearview AI, they have increased their facial data assets by sevenfold. They now report to have 20 billion faces, and their facial recognition system is used by thousands of law enforcement agencies across the US and was used by various Canadian authorities um, and before the privacy commissioner um, intervened and, and other matters stopped the use of a, uh, Clearview AI in this country. So the implications for our faces becoming data are, are many. Famously, facial recognition technology was used to chase down participants in the January 6th US Capitol riots. That was used to that, in that case, that technology was used to track down people perpetrating potentially criminal acts. But facial recognition is not an equal opportunity identifier. More faces in the machine might make algorithms more accurate, but accuracy does not cure systemic human bias. These biases speak to inequalities and problems of discrimination in the human community. These biases need to be addressed with human rights thinking about technology. Doctors Joy Boamwini and Timni Gebru 
published an influential paper in 2018 about the bias inherent in some of the major facial recognition systems at the time. In a data set of 1,270 images of faces taken from three African and three European countries, Wolam Wini and Gabru tested the ability for IBM, Microsoft, and Face++ to classify faces based on gender. Um, and they found that each of these systems struggled with not just women's faces, but dark-skinned women's faces in particular. Beyond Bolamwini and Gebru's study, an Afri a U.S. government study uh, found that there was bias against Asian and African-American faces based on algorithms developed in the U.S. But this was actually not true of systems that were developed, for example, elsewhere, like in Asia. So, in the U.S., it has been documented in multiple cases how facial recognition systems misidentified and arrested, resulted in the arrest of multiple black men because of the flaws with the way that the technology was being used and the technology itself in terms of returning bad matches. This happened in the cases of Robert Williams, Najir Parks, and Michael Oliver, all of whose stories were covered in major news media. The ACLU put Amazon's recognition facial, uh, rec uh, uh, put Amazon's recognition software to the test. And it identified 28 sitting members of the US Congress as people who had been arrested previously. And it labeled actually the late civil rights pioneer John Lewis as a criminal. So if we center the four values of autonomy, dignity, equality, and community in our thinking, it means that we have to reestablish our, uh, reevaluate how our established rights, which are designed for physical, bodily lives, translate to lives that are both analog and digital. So, in the book, as I argue, you know, sticking, the stickiness of data can change or hurt our abilities to exercise human rights. But we can shift the balance if we start thinking about data literacy as a human right. Like other types of literacy, namely linguistic literacy or numerical li literacy, data literacy is about being competent in society. Right? It's about competence. We generally accept that the ability to read and do basic math are important capacities that one has in life or one should have in life. And literacy is a big part of fulfilling our human right to education. Education is a human right that has been established not just in human rights documents like the UDHR, but also in the UN Sustainable Development Goals and in various international initiatives by the UN agency UNESCO. Now others have focused on ideas like computer literacy, media literacy, or digital literacy, and these are all ways to think about the integration of digital media and computerized tools in our lives. Data literacy, however, isn't just about using a tool like a computer. It's about understanding what kinds of considerations go into the making of the tools we now take for granted. Having a right to data literacy means that we recognize how important data have become to us as a species. Now, data are always constructed. As the off-sided phrase goes, raw data is an oxymoron. When we make data, we are taking observations in the world and recording them in some kind of systematic fashion. Whether we are recording them in terms of numbers or words or other representations to note down what we observe and find important. As observers, we decide what is important. If you're studying leaves off a tree, for example, are you looking at the shape of the leaves? Are you looking at the size, the texture, the color? What you decide is important because it reflects your own personal values and biases as the data collector of leaves, for example. So when we talk about digital data, which are taken from people, what we're really talking about is how now typically companies um, make decisions about the kinds of behaviors they think are important for analyzing people and making better products. Is it detecting eye movements as we sift through menus? Is it how quickly we type or how long it takes us to read a news story or whether we scroll to the bottom of that story at all? Is it how often we sit down or walk or stand? Each of these options 
embeds social, political, and other values into the data. These choices have effects on how these data are used to make predictions about us. In short, data creation involves many choices, and most of us are not making those choices, even if we are subject to those choices. Emerging technologies like artificial intelligence have come to bear from corporate and government interests without clear thinking about the human implications of teaching machines to learn and think. We are only starting to realize some of the most obvious harms, but it's time to think about the new capabilities we need in the age of data. If we all were to become more literate about the process of data collection and creation, how we can regulate the types of data being collected, how they are stored, and whether they can be used by what, for whom, are all questions that we can grapple with effectively or more effectively. As a human community and in our national and local governments, we could make better choices about how datafication continues with, uh, more, with more data literacy and understanding. Data literacy empowers all of us to make better demands of our policymakers and corporate leaders so that companies make more human-centric choices. By taking a step back from specific rights to the motivations and values that prompted the creation of global human rights to begin with, all of us can be more active data stakeholders rather than just subjects. So this slide presents some of the issues I explore in the book, which I'm happy to dig into more during the Q&A. But in, by way of conclusion, I have some thoughts about how we might think about human rights in the age of data. So I don't think human rights are actually a silver bullet for the challenges of datafication on humanity. But I think that the values of autonomy, community, dignity, and equality get us started down the established path of international human rights and what we think internationally as important for human potential. The scales of power in terms of where data about us goes and how much data gets taken from our activities is currently balanced towards data collectors. Typically, these are firms, sometimes they're governments. We, as the data sources, don't have much recourse at the moment. We have, you know, we have individual capacities, but these capacities are infinitesimal compared to the pooled data and AI-powered analysis of collectors. We have to come to terms with also the collective nature of data and how our individual choices for our data have implications for many others who may not agree. We may not even be able to actually claim rights to data about us because of the co-created nature of data, but also because some data are simply inherently shared. Uh, in the book, I talk about DNA data. So, you know, there are millions of customers of companies like 23andMe, people who are interested in their DNA heritage. And that means that there are millions of relatives who may or may not know that they are also implicated in the database of DNA, which is inherently shared data. Following from the idea of data literacy, we have to consider the true significance of companies like Meta, who explicitly make human rights affecting decisions about what happens on their platforms. You may have heard that before it became Meta, Facebook established an, an oversight board for activities taking place on Facebook and Instagram. Its goal is, it explicitly states that its goal is to protect freedom of expression on Meta's platforms. But the cases that come before the board often show the multiplicity of rights that are being touched on. And freedom of expression is not the only thing they consider. That's because human rights are interde interdependent. They're not piecemeal. And big tech has become the global governors of human rights through their technologies as de facto governors. But they don't have the same official status and official roles in protecting and extending human rights when it comes to the obligations that states carry. And this is a big concern going forward as these platforms, as these companies, become more pervasive in our lives and make decisions that have effects on our exercise of human rights. Finally, because data are practically forever, 
insofar as we can never, that, never verify that they are not, we also have to think about the human implications for having data floating about, about our most, very most mundane behaviors. There are technologies out there already for recreating people based on data about them. And there will be many more contenders in that space before long. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to engaging you further on these issues. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong, for your very informative and enticing lecture. Uh, I'd now like to welcome uh, anyone who's interested in asking questions to come up to one of the two mics here at the front. If you ask a question from your seat, it won't be recorded, so we do ask that you, you come up here. Will my question be recorded digitally, I would say. Yeah. To me, it seems you offer a very hopeful and, and um, fine picture of, of a digital age. But um, when you think of the role of corporations who invoke profits as a means of survival sometimes, and the speeding up of, of life in society by indiv with individuals, Data are produced so quickly and reflect so quickly back uh, to the people. And um, also the idea that uh, is, is digital data used for the service of humanity? You mentioned DNA, but DNA is often used to divide peoples into, uh, into tribal, tribal entities, if you will. Not the wholeness of humanity, but tribal identities. And so, to me, these are kind of negative aspects of, of the digital age. Now, I may not have thought about this as much as you have, of course, but, but I just wonder, what, what are your perspective about the productive essence of, of, of digital communities, digital data? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, it's a very, uh, it's a good question that could take a long time to answer, a lot of different avenues. You know, I've, I feel often very conflicted about the nature of data and how pervasive these technologies are in our lives. Um, and I think since embarking on this project, I've been a little bit more conscious in my own behavior in terms of thinking about, well, what technologies am I willing to take on and, and use for convenience, right? A lot of these things that we now take for granted make our lives easier. Some people would argue make our lives better. And, you know, I don't think that we as a species could have come through COVID-19 and, and continue to come through COVID-19 without some of these very technologies that are collecting massive amounts of data about our behaviors. So it's, it's sort of a mixed bag, right? I, I think I wanna be optimistic because as I approach this topic, I realize that a lot of the conversation has been dominated by technology, you know, technologists, or certain types of thinkers. So a lot of legal scholars and economists have been very much at the forefront of some of these debates. And as a political scientist, I think I have a lot to offer in terms of thinking about wh when do people act collectively? You know, my background in studying social movements has given me a lot of hope and perspective on how very unlikely things can happen if we can figure out how to get people to coalesce around important issues that matter. And I think that this is a question we can't get away from. We can let data collection keep happening on the terms of companies and, and you know, or we can start pushing back in more collective ways to think about the future of data. I don't think data are going away. Um, I think they do have, they do and have fundamentally changed us as a species in terms of what's known about us and what people are encouraged to do or co have come to believe. There are a lot of negative side effects, I think, or at least different side effects from how we experience media and information before um, the pervasiveness of data. So 
it's not that I don't it's not that I don't see the negative, but I do think that human rights has actually been a tool that's been missing in a lot of the conversation. People talk a lot about ethics. I think ethics are really important, but ethics are not human rights, right? Human rights are legally binding instruments that have come from extensive debate and conversation, and they offer protections for millions of people the world over, and I think it's time we start thinking about them in the context of data more seriously. Dr. Wang, uh, thank you very much for your very expansive uh, analysis of a very important and topical uh, issue. Let me first start by welcoming you to the province where the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was born. And let me explain what I mean by that. John Peters Humphrey, who was teaching at McGill University Law, was in his office and got the call from Eleanor Roosevelt to invite him to write the first draft of the Universal Declaration. John Peters Humphrey is from a place, was born and raised very close to Fredericton in Hampton, New Brunswick. So you are in a very special province when you talk about the uh, right. Universal Do Declaration yep. of Human Rights. My question is, how do you bring in your perspective about balance and trade-offs for human rights in the context of your analysis? What I'm thinking of is when we talk about the operational aspects of human rights, we know that individual rights have to be minimized in order to benefit the collectivity. And we've accepted that with respect to freedom of speech, for example, where an individual's human rights with respect to freedom of speech cannot identify a particular community or religious group that is hurtful to that community. So there is an essence that when we do this balancing act, uh, we have to give up some individual rights in order to gain more collective rights. The other thing is the trade-off that uh, is necessarily an aspect of your conversation here is when we, even in individual rights, with the, the face recognition is what brought this to my mind, even with individual rights, I may be prepared to give up some of my individual rights through face recognition if I want to be surveyed from the place where I live to the place where I'm going to work for the benefit of being safe and not being mugged and not being accosted. And if I need medical attention or help, it will be forthcoming. All of that comes about as a result of the cameras on the doorbells, the police helicopters flying above. So in a certain extent, civil society is at the stage where they're prepared to give up some individual rights in order to gain some other aspect of similarly individual rights. That's what I mean by trade-offs and balance, and uh, I invite your comment. I think, yeah, I mean, I, I really appreciate your, your comment and question there, um, particularly about the history of the UDHR. Um, I hadn't thought of that, but thank you for that. I mean, it's, it's um, I think the way you put it is very well thought out, very well put, and probably different from most people, even writing in, in the media, thinking about the trade-offs. And I think, you know, Yes, and when we think about human rights, there are always ways that they sometimes conflict, and we have to think about under what conditions we let one take more precedence over another, right? So, so when we think about you know, freedom of speech issues during the pandemic in terms of lockdown, you know, what the right to health of the community versus individual choices, right? And I think that you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, I don't know like what else to, to say other than the fact that these are exactly the types of conversations we should be having, 
But you as an individual have thought about this very clearly. But I don't think that most people have done that kind of trade-off. And I'm not sure other people would have that same kind of answer about the collective versus the individual. And I think that's really important. And the reason I say that is because a lot of what we think about exercising rights online has to do with consent, right? Click consent. We all click, I agree, right, to the terms and conditions. That's just a click, you know, that's the natural practice these days. That's taken as your agreement to whatever contract has been laid out. Well, frankly, th that's just becoming meaningless because none of us, mo well, many of you are lawyers in this room, but I'm not a lawyer. I cannot read these documents and fully understand what it is that, that I'm trading off but I'm technically legally consenting. And I think that is no longer gonna be the way that we, have, we can think about how we exercise rights individually. And I also think that because of the way data are being used in terms of collected by, from individual behaviors but pooled into collective analysis and, and the way that groups, new groups are created through data that we're not really aware of, um, I think it's more important than ever for people to understand that data are not just, quote, mine. They actually affect a whole, a whole bunch of people in society we may or may not know. And those groups are being created not by us, but by companies that are collecting the data and trying to understand us better. So this is why I think it is actually a real challenge for human rights application in thinking about a world where the data, the phenomenon of interest that is affecting all of us and changing all our lives has this duality to it. It's both individual, but it's also collective. And how do we think about that? It's, I think it goes beyond trading off speech versus health, for example. I think that's a difficult and, and um, problematic trade off, but this is even harder, right? And I, and I think the data, the DNA data example is just one where lots of people have done that They've given away their DNA data without thinking about the fact that everyone related to them is also now partially in a data set without consent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong, for your presentation tonight. And it, it's my privilege, but also uh, fear that I have to follow these two wonderful gentlemen who I know very well. Uh, and I'm. I have been provoked in, in sitting here thinking about human rights and data and data literacy. And my work is in war, in conflict, and the impact of conflict, particularly on civilians. And I've been thinking about human rights and how it applies and doesn't apply to certain populations. And I think that data literacy is, is a privilege that we have that I absolutely think we should engage in. But I also think about the flip side. So, more comments than questions, but maybe you can f make it into a question to answer something here. There is also an opportunity, because with data now, with the opportunity for tech using technology to record experiences, to stay connected to your family if you are in Canada and they are in Syria or Afghanistan, but also being able to record what's happening in front of you in, in a place like Iran today, enables us to stand up in this very privileged part of the world and maybe make a difference there. Uh, and so I was thinking about the, a similar thing in terms of the collective good versus the individual risk. And for me, I'm willing to take it for that. And uh, so not a question, but a comment. But I'm, I'm grateful for the, the, the way you've made me think. Yeah, thank you for your comments. Um, I think initially, you know, maybe 20 years ago, people working in human rights were very excited about the, the potential for these technologies to change the way that we do human rights, right? And, and the way that we protect human rights through technology. And I, I don't think that that's actually false. I think that that's true still. Um, I just think that there are vulnerabilities that we perhaps haven't thought about or didn't think about at the time that are now becoming quite evident. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I think this is why, um, and I didn't say this explicitly in the, book, in the talk today, but in the book, you know, I, I think datafications here to stay for multiple reasons. Um, one of which is, uh, you know, I, I find that a lot of the technologies are useful and helpful, not just for me as, a, as an individual, but I, as exactly for society and for thinking about the things that have been enabled as a result of this, these technologies. So, you know, as with any, any sort of advancement in technology, there's a flip side. And so 
you know, developing the technology is one thing, but what we do and what we don't allow is not a function of technology companies. That is a function of, in this case, I think all of us, we need to figure that out as, as a collective. I think that for too long, the same voices have really been at the forefront. I think it's, you know, a very homogenous group making the apps, developing the technologies. And we see that with the bias in, in facial recognition technology, right? So it's not that everyone is going to be an activist or everyone's got to become a data scientist. That's not what I mean by data literacy. I, I really think it should just be taught in classes to high school, to high school students just as, you know, how to read a stock market table, for example, was part of my, you know, basic coursework or thinking about civics. How can you be civically literate? Like, who, do we have a presidential or prime ministerial system in Canada? That's something you should, we should all know, right? So, so this literacy is not about knowing what to do with the data. It's knowing that these data are being collected and what are the consequences and understanding better whether we want those consequences or not. What are we giving up? What are we gaining? So um, I, I think that that's, so I'm sort of just responding to your <laughs> comment because <laughs> there wasn't a question, but I, I'm glad we, we see you know, these issues similarly. So thanks. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Sure. Um, piggybacking off some of the comments over there, I wonder how would we view things like Trayvon Martin and um, the injustice of many people if had not been caught by data, right? So yep. where does that balance come in? What are the trade-offs that we can accept to have those justices that we need to have in our society? Thank you. Sure, I love how last questions are so hard. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, can't, I just got to fall back to my answer, right, which is, yes, the technologies that enable people to record these unjust killings of, you know, black men also is then reflected on that same community to unjustly identify them as, as criminals and as, as, you know, questionable citizens in a, in a society. And so I think what I... What I said about, it's not the technology that's necessarily biased, it's that our society is biased, right? And so it, this is what our, our social norms and beliefs are just reflected in the algorithm. You know, the algorithms don't make themselves, you know, even if they, they're, they're self-training, like somebody has to create that algorithm. Somebody has infused that algorithm with values. And so what we're seeing in a lot of the, the sort of dysfunctional or unjust outcomes for AI and the way that data are analyzed and people are shifted into to or sifted into categories of you know uncreditworthy right or likely criminal is reflecting a lot of the same problematic racist discriminatory attitudes we see in society. So the machine is just making more of what we believe or what certain people believe. I think. So again, you know, the same technology or or other technologies can be used to highlight those injustices, right? So it's not that, it's not that I think that data are bad or that emerging technologies are bad. I think it's the way that we have not put safeguards on their use or the safeguards on the use of our data that are creating a lot of the problems that we have today. And this is the role of social scientists. This is the role of people who aren't working in tech fields to really think this through. Um, it's not, you know, these questions of datafication are not limited to those with technical knowledge. They develop the tools, but all of us are subject to those tools. Many of us use those tools, and, and it's time to really infuse the conversation with human rights so that we can put some of these basic values of autonomy and, and dignity and equality back into the equation when, you know, forcing technology creators to actually think about the human consequences of their, of their products, which they don't, they don't have to, right? So I think that's sort of where I, where I started with some of this que the questions, and I think, that's where, I think that's where I'll end, is that we all have a role, we have a stake in this, what happens, and I think we have a role to play in, in determining that future, because it's not written yet. So thank you very much, everyone.
I'd, li I'd now like to welcome Drs. Cindy Brown and Lisa Todd to the podium to announce the VGOD Scholarship recipient. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Todd. I'm the chair of the Department of History at UNB. Um, and we're, we're very delighted to be invited here tonight. This is my colleague, Dr. Cindy Brown. She's the executive director of the Gregg Center for the, war, the Study of War and Society and also the director of our honors program in the history department. So I want to say thank you first to the organizers for having us here tonight. It's greatly appreciated. And of course, thank you to Bernie V. God's family, inc including Zena, of course. Um, who has been funding these scholarships for decades. Um, I'm dating myself, but I'll say that I was the recipient of one of these awards in the early 1990s. Uh, so it means a lot to me to be here this evening. I'm now going to turn it over. First of all, we'd like Aiden to come forward. He's hiding up at the back. But if Aiden, if you'd like to come down to the stage. Oh, I've put him on the spot. <laughs> I think if we're going to compliment you, everyone should be able to see you. <laughs> Yes, right up here. <laughs> so this is Aidan Keenan, and Dr. Brown's going to tell you a bit more about Aidan and his accomplishments. We really didn't need two people to come here and do this, but we were so excited about being in person and, and reviving and, and reinvigorating this relationship that we've had with St. Thomas University for some time and honoring uh, Dr. Bernie B. God's legacy and memory as well. So we, we just we couldn't decide who was coming, so we both wanted to come. and. <laughs> Uh, and we're very proud of Aiden. Uh, Aiden is a third year honors student. He's a New Brunswick native, uh, so th from the province of the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and maybe you didn't know that before you arrived here tonight. <laughs> he is the president of our UMB History Society. He's been an intern at the York Region Museum uh, and been involved in different exhibit developments there. He also did summer school this summer in Ireland. Thank you very much to COVID for allowing him to do that because it's a wonderful opportunity for our students to travel abroad, abroad and, and experience different cultures and different ways of thinking. It's crucial for their development. Uh, but the one thing we love about Aiden is his revival of our Student History Society, and that's so crucial because human rights is all about community, absolutely, uh, and, and being together and, and understanding each other and doing our best to do that. And, and, and Aiden's definitely been a leadership in doing that, and we've seen some great growth after a really difficult period during COVID. And so just a final thank you very much for inviting us here tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Wendy Wong, for your, your very provocative discussion tonight. And thank you very much, Sina, as well, for being here. And uh, so, Aiden. Congratulations. I don't think you need to give a no. speech. But no. <laughs> Would you like to say a few words? Well, it is so good to have uh, an event in person again after uh, being online for a couple of years, but uh, this lecture series has kept on, so that's great. It is always my great pleasure to um, be able to thank the guest presenter. Um, and Dr. Wong, you have truly enlightened us um, as to the challenges that uh, digital technology poses to our human rights. And you've made me realize anyway that we are our data and that when our data is out there, we are being exposed. And in some ways, as you say, there are some positive aspects, but there also can be some very negative consequences and, and our privacy can be threatened and it can do harm, be discriminatory and violate our human rights. So I think it's important um, for us to recognize and acknowledge and understand how datafication and facial recognition and AI and the alg algorithms and AI have really changed our human experiences. And, and that's why I think, and as you have indicated, 
that makes it even more important for us to have a framework of human rights to guide us and to safeguard um, the datafication and to protect, as you say, our dignity, equality, autonomy, and the term you've used, community. So thank you so much for your uh, profound insight and uh, sharing your experiences and a, a glimpse at your uh, new book that's upcoming and also the challenges that, um, that you've made us um, pose to us as well, that we all have a role to play. So thank you. And it is uh, also uh, my honor um, to award you with, <laughs> wait, <laughs> I heard it was here, behind the scene here. So um, the Atlantic uh, Human Rights Center would like to honor you with an award for excellence in the service of human rights. So this is heavy. <laughs> Outstanding contribution. Um, I'd also like to uh, take this opportunity um, on behalf of my daughters, uh, Simone and Michelle Vigod, which unfortunately they're not here this evening, um, the Vigod family and the friends of uh, Dr. Bernie Vigod. Um, we want to wish, Aiden, where did you go, Keenan? <laughs> we want to. Um, wish you the best of luck in uh, all your future endeavors, and also to thank uh, the University of New Brunswick and the History Department for your continued support uh, with this scholarship. So thank you. And of course, I want to give a heartful thanks uh, very especially to St. Thomas University President Russell. Um, thank you for your opening remarks. But also, thank you so much. You always say such kind words about Bernie, and uh, um, it, it's, I really appreciate that personally. So thank you, and thank you uh, for, to St. Thomas University for supporting this lecture for th over 30 years, 32 years to be exact. So thank you so much. <laughs> I also want to uh, thank a very special person, and that's Christina Shirley, um, the director of the Atlantic Center, um, the Atlantic Human Rights Center, for organizing the lecture, for your ongoing support and dedication, uh, and also for your friendship. This would not happen without you, so thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, I know because of COVID, some people may have been hesitant to come. I know some of the students were given a little bit of an incentive to come. But thank you so much. And I hope you have um, benefited from this talk this evening. And I would just like to end by saying this. History was Dr. V. God's um, life career. But human rights was his passion. And it is so critical in our age of technology that we seek truth and strive for dignity and equality. And I heard a quote recently from uh, the Filipino journalist uh, Maria Risa, who won um, uh, the Nobel Prize. And she said, without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. And without these, we have no shared space, and democracy is a dream. So thank you. That concludes our lecture for this evening. Uh, please help yourself to some refreshments in the foyer.